Critical decisions loom, testing Mayor Kevin Faulkner's leadership. The governor and lawmakers agree on a water bond proposal. A San Diego freshman makes a big splash in Sacramento. And the rideshare upstart Uber has taxi companies crying foul. I'm Mark Sauer, and the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome. It's Friday, August 22nd. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are Scott Lewis, CEO of Voice of San Diego, Katie Orr, state government reporter at Capital Public Radio in Sacramento, and Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks. Well, the city council may be on hiatus, but San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner is not. He has a couple of big decisions facing him, and this month and how he deals with these issues will affect all of us and his own political fortunes. Uh, Scott, you wrote this week it's kind of a time of soul-searching for, uh, for our new mayor. Well, I think he has a moment right now. He can decide whether he really wants to lead on some big decisions, on some big you know, dilemmas in the city, or he can decide to maybe lead from behind, uh, in particular on the minimum wage issue, for example. Uh, you know, Obviously, there's a referendum going forward to throw that increase out. He has said he supports that referendum. But is he going to go out and collect signatures? Is he going to really uh, make, a, make a case that this needs to be thrown out, that he's going to really lead on this? Or is he going to let it happen? And, and then also, as a Republican, as a, as a conservative, he has uh, an alternative vision of how to help the working poor, I assume. And so is he going to try to articulate that and say, look, here's a better way uh, for the working poor to get, their, to get their foothold. And so I think that's a big issue. And then there's the convention center. Uh, what are we going to do? I mean, this thing, this is a giant $520 million expansion. They threw out the tax increase, the appellate court did. Are you going to appeal it to the Supreme Court and hope that they you know, somehow resurrect it? Or are you going to try to put something on the ballot? Or are you going to try to combine it with a charger stadium? Or are you going to try to get rid of it and just uh, focus on infrastructure that the neighborhoods care about? These are all big issues that we haven't seen him really take a stand on, to lead. And, uh, and I think he has an opportunity to, or again, just lead from behind. Well, it's interesting. They launched the, uh, the folks who want to overturn that minimum wage ordinance, launched their campaign yesterday. Yeah. Of course, today we're reporting on the counterweight to that. Sherry Leitner and some other Democrats in the council are going to fight that campaign, right. and they launched that this morning. But uh, with that, that minimum wage, um, that's a very difficult uh, decision. Uh, and Kevin Faulkner was on KPBS. I want to play a bite here from what he said. Now, this was before the council had uh, overridden that veto. You know, the state's already raising the minimum wage. So the question was, should the council raise it on top of that when we haven't even had a chance and an opportunity for that to seek in? I don't want to put our jobs at risk in our city at a disadvantage. I want to create good opportunities for San Diego. And so that's the wrong policy for us to be doing right now. And I'm going to veto it and we'll continue to be vocal to support particularly our small businesses that are struggling to hire people and get them into work. All, all right, so he sounded pretty definite, obviously did override the veto, but we didn't see him yesterday. He wasn't there at the press conference. Right. We tried to get a uh, comment from him, and right. it was late in the day. He finally issued a statement. It's not like, as you say, he's leading out and, and right. charging and we've out seen this, this. We've seen this before. When Carl DeMaio was running the, uh, the effort to change pensions for the future and future employees, he was out collecting signatures himself. He's out there driving people to the poll to, to get them to sign. He's you know, announcing where he's going to be to get them to sign. Uh, on the other hand, when they were trying to pass the uh, tax increase, after the fires in 2007. Jerry Sanders nominally supported that, and he, and he would give positive comments, but he never really forcefully did it, and it failed. So there's different ways uh, of engagement for a city leader, for a politician on these issues. And it, sound, it seems like Kevin Faulkner's you know, comfortable saying you should throw this out, but I don't know how comfortable he is saying get rid of this, and, uh, and here's the alternative, here's the vision. And then on the convention center, same thing. What are we going to do? There's a lot of big questions out there, and it's all dependent on what the mayor decides to rally. He has a unique ability to frame the issues, to, to get media to come to his, to his uh, uh, experiences, to his events, and to um, get people rallied in coalitions. He has not done that yet. No, the min go Katie, Honestly, go ahead. Mark, I would say uh, some people might argue he has a point about the state raising the minimum wage. Uh, they did do that. It's going to go up over the next two years. There was a bill pending this session to raise it again on top of that, including a cost of living escalator because the one that passed, I don't believe, had that in it. Uh, I spoke with uh, Marnie Cox yesterday, the economist at Sandak, who was saying 
for it to really work, it has to be a region-wide thing, at least, because someone can cross the city limits and go to Del Mar and open their business there yeah. and not have to pay that. So the city would argue if they come into the city of San Diego for any time, that the city will enforce the minimum wage for those hours. But yeah, that's correct. I mean, if you have some business you can usually move, you're going to avoid it. Um, what they argue is that the municipality cities actually have a higher cost of living, therefore they should be a higher minimum wage. Uh, but yeah, these are these are all big issues. Uh, I think a lot of people would prefer that the state just take the lead on it. But, uh, but and then this... it makes it fair, as we're saying, across the board. And you don't have to set up this competition among, exactly, yeah. among cities within a region. Let's talk about the convention center. You note that yeah. the leaders are all in a dither about this, but the average Joe public really doesn't care so much. Well, yeah, I mean, it truly is a project for other people, right? It's for people who come to San Diego, for people who don't live here. And so it's hard. People don't, you go to these community meetings, you go member copies that we have, they don't care about it. What they care about obviously is jobs and so they make that connection all the time about the jobs and about the economic activity but um, but they need to make a bigger case especially if they're going to take it to the vote about why uh, why this tax increase uh, should go to a convention center and a stadium as opposed to libraries and streets mm -hmm. you know and all sorts of other things <laughs> now we uh, we noted that the council could have tried to ram this onto the ballot this fall they, they chose not to do that already yeah and as you said a little earlier it's not clear really where the mayor stands or even the council leaders at this point on do we want an expansion do we want to marry this up with a as they say, non-continuous facility, maybe right. a Charger Stadium, dual-purpose facility, right. or forget the whole idea because Comic-Con's not pulling out anyway. I thought it was really interesting the other day when Mayor, former Mayor Jerry Sanders, uh, almost Freudian slip there, but when former <laughs> Mayor Jerry Sanders uh, made an indication that he was open, if this doesn't work, to a uh, non-contiguous football type of contraption thing. Mm -hmm. And same thing, uh, uh, Congressman Scott Peters, we were talking to him the other day. He was used to be on the Port Commission. He said, look, if you get 80% of what you wanted, maybe you should go with it. So you're starting to see people kind of like uh, gingerly go toward that. But again, it takes a leader to say, all right, this is the plan. Here's the architecture designs. This is why you should vote for it. And this is when the vote's going to be. We have not seen that yet. And nobody's even given an indication when we will. Uh, well, Megan? it's not just taking a stand sort of on these, these specifics. But I think, you know, we heard him coming out of the gate talking about neighborhoods. He still signs his Facebook yeah, post, One San, San Diego. Diego. Right. Um, so, you know, he needs to also take a, the lead as a Republican and articulate, you know, why the convention center may matter to somebody living in City Heights or, or you know, how his, his his, this minimum wage issue is actually, you know, why his idea is better for neighborhoods. And he's, I don't think he's quite making that point. Yeah, and we've seen this tension between downtown and the neighborhoods for a while. And so if he's going to oppose minimum wage and if he's going to support some sort of convention center, I think you make a great point. It's not just about, it can't be just about downtown, especially if it needs to go to a, a ballot, right? Like, because people, when I talk to them, they care about water, they care about libraries, they care about schools. And none of them say, man, I wish that the, the, the urologists have a better place to, to hang out. You know, that's not something that they're really <laughs> high on their priority. <laughs> one last, uh, before we leave this topic, one last question I wanted to throw out was, uh, what about his uh, political fortunes and how he decides on these critical issues here? Because he's got to come up again here in, in 2016. Well, look, he's doing a lot of this zip lining into Comic-Con. He does the ride around Fiesta Island, you know, Jason Mraz and him uh, hung out at the mayor's office. But I think he needs to, yeah, he needs to have a couple of big wins where he says, this is why the city's different, this is why it's better because of what I did, and that's what you take to a re-election campaign. He has a couple of opportunities here right now, and we'll see what he does. And I was a leader on this issue. Right. Yeah. All right, we'll shift gears now. Amid our relentless drought, California lawmakers and Governor Brown have agreed on a $7.5 billion water bond issue for voters to consider this November. And the bond proposal passed with overwhelming bipartisan support, and that masked a months of very hard wrangling. Katie, start with an overview of the kinds of projects that this bond is uh, going to address. Well, um, perhaps the biggest piece of it and the part that was the most controversial was the amount of water that, or the amount of money that would go towards storage projects like building dams and reservoirs uh, so that when we have droughts like this, we have enough water to sort of get us through. Um, the Republicans had really wanted $3 billion allocated for that. When Governor Jerry Brown came out with his uh, bond proposal, he had put in 2.5 billion. So, you know, in terms of billions of dollars, they're not that far apart. And they ended up 
compromising on $2.7 billion for bonds. Um, there's going to be $500 million to improve groundwater quality. There's going uh, $1.47 billion to go towards ecosystem protection. So there's a whole list of projects that is going into this bond. Now, is this a tax increase or is it just a, an obligation on the government? It's an obligation. They would be they would be taking out these bonds and they would go towards this thing. Of course, you know, seven and a half billion dollars, but um, interest. So over right. the years, we're going to be end up paying a lot more. But uh, there are a lot of people out there that argue that you know there's not a better way for the state to spend its money if we right. need to get through. Which is know, why the, the Republicans crisis. supported it so much. Exactly right? I mean, right, and this was really a coalition of people. It didn't always break down on party lines. Uh, representatives from the Central Valley have different thoughts and needs versus representatives from the coastal cities, and so there were those sorts of coalitions. And this was really all of them coming together in like the very last hours. They actually passed a bill that gave them two extra days to get it on uh, the ballot. And then they went from there. And so it was really everyone coming together. And they truly celebrated. I mean, the mood at the Capitol was like, we just did this amazing thing, <laughs> which is, they, they were all very so excited. Right, they did. And it's a lot of money. And it's been something, yeah. um, They their original bond, they had passed an $11 billion bond in 2009. And they were only changing it because they saw polls showed that it would not pass. It was too much money. Well, what are the, what's the likelihood now? Any polls out yet or, or well, which way is uh, the wind blowing? I think that it probably has a good uh, chance because all the lawmakers are behind it. And so everyone's <laughs> going to go to their their base and say, you need to vote for this. This is why you need to vote for this. You know, this is something that is vital for the state. And so I think people probably expect that it will pass. So you mentioned the water, uh, the uh, the dams and the red water storage projects, I'm trying to say, yeah. are mostly aimed at Northern California. What's, what's in it down here in Southern California, San Diego in particular? Well, it's all about groundwater management. And that's actually the next uh, push at the state legislature right now because California does not manage its groundwater. So if you wanted to drill a well and take the water from that well on your land, you are allowed to. But the problem is we're depleting that at a rapid pace. Tremendous. We had a story just today, Los Angeles Times has it on the front page, about trillions in the West have been de depleted since 2013 in this drought. Right, absolutely. Trillions and of so, gallons, that is. Yeah. yeah, and so that is how this is going to be, um, you know, I think that will be the next area and that we will see a big fight over. And Southern California is certainly going to be a huge part of that because it takes up so much of the water. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really, um, and in, in terms of groundwater management and environmental protection and, and things like that, this region will benefit as also well. Also an idea kicking around about a huge desal plan on Camp Pendleton, which is federal land, how that would work, I don't know. I think it's a, a brainstorm at this point, but it's it, the scope is it's gonna dwarf the one that's already half built up there in Carlsbad. Well, I think what you're seeing is the realization that people are having that there is not enough water. The state is growing. If we have any more dry years like this, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Which are being predicted long term, of Right. Course. And so you have to start looking at alternatives like desalination and, and, and like potable reuse, which I know has been a big issue down here. You're just going to have to start mm -hmm. looking at them if you want water. Well, they, they always have to dance this interesting line because they don't want to freak out too much because then businesses and others would be like, well, maybe I shouldn't move my business to California. Right. On the other hand, they have to freak out because we need to freak out. There's yeah. not a lot of water. The public's got to conserve. They got to do something. Right. We. It's one thing to have a you know civilization in Northern California, but we're we're at the end of the straw here, and uh, and so yeah, we need to buttress. This. We need to communicate confidence that's real about why we have water. I and I think that's one of the problems they were facing, which is why we have now statewide mandatory water restrictions because people who are not near the reservoirs don't see it. You turn on your tap, you have water. You don't right. realize. Right. And so they were really trying, and it was. Again, that balance, you don't want to scare people, but they have to know that they right. have what they do matters. And we're still not hearing it. I mean, a month ago they right. said mandatory and all, but you're not seeing the water police. You're not seeing a, lot, a big emphasis. In this segment, I did want to shift gears here. You're, you're in San Diego. You're doing a story on women in government. And uh, one is Lorena Gonzalez here, who mm -hmm. uh, uh, a woman from this area, of course, who's making a big splash yes. uh, to use a pun up there in Sacramento. <laughs> uh, tell us uh, about uh, this freshman and what she's been doing. Well, um, I think, you know, most notably, uh, just last night, she tweeted a picture of uh, Senator Ben Wesso apparently 
drinking at the Capitol. And arrested and, later for on suspicion of a DUI. Right. You know. So she has and since deleted that tweet. But, yeah. you know, she's involved in everything. Yeah, she's <laughs> stirring things up <laughs> all sorts of ways. In one way or yeah. another. Um, she really has been a key player in a lot of big legislation up there. Um, most notably, she carried the bill that allows undocumented immigrants to become practicing attorneys in California, which was a huge deal for them. Um, she is sponsoring a bill right now that would require all workers who work at least 30 days in California to receive three paid sick days, which is very controversial and something people in the business world have told me they are very worried about because obviously that's money, you know, and so she, but that is a uh, pretty far along in the process that made it out of appropriations. Um, she was sponsoring a bill that would um, help uh, supplement diapers for women on uh, and families on the CalWORKs program, but that bill did not make it out of the legislature. But, you know, she's been there about a year and she is everywhere. Her name yeah, is everywhere. There's that one bill so, where if you let your lawn go brown right. uh, in an HOA, the HOA can't can't force you to, you know, water it. Right, so it right. Like, so little things and big things. Yeah. And, and yeah, and what she does on Twitter, and that's, that's interesting, she got in a little trouble with that because she does enroll you in her story, right? She shares photos of her family. Mm -hmm. She really tries to get you to follow the, the narrative that she's in, engaged in and, and is working, made her very popular. Uh, but yeah, she's, uh, she's, she stumbles sometimes. Yeah. What, what about ambitions here? I mean, politicians are usually ambitious, most of them. Right. We've got a uh, very senior sen senator here, uh, Dianne Feinstein in mm -hmm. California. Of course, the governor is uh, not going to be around forever. Uh, <laughs> what do you see? Any inklings at well, this point? Well, I think it's a long way for her from assembly to governor's from, from office. From a freshman right. to, to get there right now. <laughs> but I mean, if she keeps going and having success, it's not hard to imagine that she might find a seat in the state Senate one day if that is something that she chooses to go. I mean, she she seems to be someone that the Latino caucus is putting out there. Um, as an example, there's a reason that she's involved in so many of these bills. People are funneling them to her. They want her to be the face of these bills uh, for whatever reason. And if, so she, if she keeps having success and stays out of too much trouble, I think you probably could see her ascend to the Senate or possibly state office, a higher state office down the line. Okay, so she could have a, a great deal of, of ambition. Uh, some of the other folks that you're talking about today, here in your story and your reporting? Oh, I'm interviewing uh, Tony Atkins uh, tomorrow. Uh, she, of course, another, you know, San Diego, I have to say, is very well represented at the state level right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tony Atkins is a speaker of the assembly. That's the third most powerful position in, this, in the in legislature. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, you guys are really having a moment <laughs> okay. up in Southern California. All right. All right, we'll, we'll bask in that moment. Right. Uh, all right, we're going to shift gears here to our, to our next segment. And whether they don't uh, want to drink and then drive or simply need a quick and, a quick and cheap, cheap way to get somewhere, young adults are flocking to Uber, and so are their parents. Uh, that's the mobile rideshare app that allows smartphone users to get a ride in just minutes. And Megan, your story this week showed how Uber's having an effect not so much on the customers of taxi cabs, but on the drivers. Right, so it's sort of, I think, surprising for people to hear, but it's actually the drivers that are causing the problem for cab owners. Cab company owners say that they, they haven't lost customers, they still have plenty of calls every day to fill their cabs, but it's actually the drivers who are fleeing to Uber, and these drivers are how these cab companies make their money. Um, a lot of people may think that cab companies make their money by picking up a passenger. Well, it's actually, they make their money um, by leasing their car out to a driver and collecting that monthly lease from the driver. And so that's where cab companies are running into, into trouble. So uh, before we get a little deeper into that, let's uh, tell folks who may not be familiar exactly what Uber is and how it works. Right. So and, and, and Lynx is another rideshare uh, service, right? Web-based. Lyft, uh, yeah. Uh, Lyft, I'm sorry. Yeah, Lyft. so Uber, which I focus more specifically on in my story, is a web-based app, um, and it's where you call up a ride on your iPhone, and, um, and a, a black car arrives and takes you to your destination. And it's really winning over a lot of people because it's convenient, because everything is just based on your phone. Um, and, and Uber San Diego has thousands of drivers in San Diego County right now, and so they're able to get to have really quick pickup times. Um, so that's one advantage. And mm -hmm. are they cheaper than a taxi ride generally? It depends. Um, they could be half the cost, but they could be significantly more. It depends on whether or not you're willing to take the small, you know, Prius, or if you want the big SUV. Oh. Um, and then they also, unlike the cab industry, can do surge pricing. So if there's a huge need for drivers at that time, they'll bump the price up. Oh, supply and demand. And then Scott. there's an accessibility 
everything, and they're making more parts of the city accessible to people who don't have cars. So I, I got a, a, a comment from somebody who said, look, I used to try to get cabs all the time, but unless you were going to the beach areas or something like that, they wouldn't necessarily be excited about taking you to southeastern San Diego or to these other parts of San Diego. And so uh, what it's really doing is really disrupting the, the place, but it's also making some areas more accessible. And I think it's fascinating. It's really unveiling the actual business model of taxi cabs that are based on uh, a, a constrained supply, an artificially constrained supply of these licenses that they have, and then and then the sort of groups and the mechanics of people who get to buy those licenses and own them and use them. And uh, and now uh, the whole state doesn't know what to do about it. Well, yeah, actually, yeah, Katie, there's something going on in yeah, Sacramento, right? Yeah, that's a right? good point because... Um, you know, these cars, Uber and Lyft, and the sidecar is one, they don't have the same insurance requirements that taxi cabs have to have. And, you know, they would argue that, well, we don't, we're not really a, I'm not a taxi, I'm just a private person, you know, picking someone up. But there was a situation in San Francisco where an Uber driver who was waiting for a ride hit and uh, hit three pedestrians and a little girl died. Mm. And so the family is, is uh, you know, wants to sue Uber. And Uber says, no, he didn't have a passenger. He was not our employee. So we don't have to pay. And so there's a whole... There's a whole like can of worms around regulations that the state is starting to delve into, and Uber and Lyft drivers do not want more regulation um, on their industry. They rallied at the state capitol. They're trying to beat this insurance bill. Um, there's issues with Uber and Lyft and them going to airports because they don't pay the same permits that taxis do. And then you get into the whole dis uh, whole discussion: Is the state stifling a startup company, a creative economy, or are they just trying to make everyone play by the same rules? And obviously. Your position is going to depend. Yeah, on Megan, it. what do the what do the taxi folks say about this uneven playing field regarding regulation? Right. So, so they say it's sort of unfair. There's a cost of doing business, and it's higher if you're more highly regulated. Um, but they're also saying this is about the customers and about public safety. Um, so, going back to your access comment, um, the reason taxis are regulated within the city is they're sort of seen as another piece of the public transit puzzle. And so, they actually, I mean, you do get in cabs, and maybe you can tell a driver doesn't want want to drive you to a certain area, but by law, they're supposed to take you wherever you want to go. They're supposed to drive you if you're a senior. They're supposed to drop you off in that alley if that's where they have to drop you off at. And so um, the, the cab companies are saying, you know, we're highly regulated because this service is necessary. Um, we need our service to, to be sustained and so regulate these guys to a similar level. When, I, when I asked uh, the speaker Atkins, Tony Atkins about this, and I think this is going to be the theme going forward, she said, yeah, we do need to consider re regulations, but my, my wife is going to freak out if we, if we cut the service because she uses it so much. And that's what they're going to see all around. It's mm -hmm. become so popular that, you know, cutting this off, Uber has a direct connection to this crowd of supporters that it's going to be a really interesting balance that maybe they don't have so often with regulations that don't necessarily affect everyday people like this. Uh, it maybe affects a business, maybe huge for the business, but this is very clear and something that people can see. And Uber just sent out an email the other day. It said, call your senator, call your assembly person, yeah. and make this happen or make this, you know, They're stop. saying it's going to kill ride-sharing altogether in the state. This well, and that's what, you, I just did a story, and it's that's where you see the big um, people rise up so often when it's things that affect them. For Gas prices are supposed to go up, uh, possibly could go up in January because of cap and trade rules in, in the state. And there is a there is a campaign now to call your lawmaker, tell them to, you know, overturn this hidden gas tax, which, you know, it's been in place since uh, 2009 or something. It's not a surprise that it was coming. Yeah. But when it hits people's wallets like that, that is when lawmakers have to be careful. Because if people are angry, they, you know, it could not be good for them, you know, incumbent or not, Democrat, or Republican, people don't like losing things that they use all the time. I wanted to bring up and throw out the idea of the demographic of this. Uh, you know, when I was, my, my daughter's in her 20s, they use Uber all the time. They're not going to drive drunk. They aren't going to take a chance if they're down partying somewhere. And I never thought of paying for a cab when I was their age. But it seems like, uh, you know, these folks don't, don't think about it. They just want to, you know, get to where they're going and they're willing to pay for it. 
Yeah, you know, I think, and that's sort of the thing um, with, with regulation is, you're right, like the customers won't really recognize everything in the background. They just know that they like this service, they want it to stick around. Um, but it's sort of the same thing when you're leaving a bar or something. I don't think you're thinking about working conditions for Uber drivers versus lease drivers or thinking about insurance. You're just thinking about getting home. And so there are some people who will still try to flag a, a cab down, and if they can't, they'll call Uber. But I also spoke with um, the, the manager of a bar downtown and he said you know customers used to ask me all the time to call up, call up a cab for them I don't get those requests anymore because mm -hmm. before they even step outside they're on their phone I think that's what's different mark I think that you didn't have an iPhone that you could just look at and, and push a button you don't have cash you don't need cash you don't need anything you don't have to give a tip and it almost feels like I bet you some of them don't even consider the cost that, like the way that we might have with cash when we had to deal with that sort of thing and so the whole dynamic has changed. They've made it so easy, basically, to get a, a ride somewhere that it's, it's exploded. And now they're starting to do services. They'll, they'll go buy diapers for you. They'll go do all kinds of stuff. It's fascinating. All, it's all about convenience and, right. uh, and not the thinking so much of that. All right. Well, I'll tell you, we're going to hear a lot more from that. It's a big business, and it's coming up like crazy, and I know out of Sacramento. And it's great to see you back, Katie, and <laughs> thanks for being here today. We're going to have to wrap it up. That does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guest, Scott Lewis, voice of San Diego, Katie Orr of Capital Public Radio in Sacramento, and Megan Burks of KPBS News. A reminder, all of the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.